Give me the right power, and I can plane a kitchen table. A naval architect told us that if we gave him the right power he could plane a kitchen table. We did and he could. A Merc 110 was just right for our kitchen table. A kitchen table isn't a boat of course, but it does demonstrate that you can select a Merc that will do the job you want it to do, and more. What a brilliant advertisement, I'm sure some of you still remember it. Now, I want to take you back in time and continue the story of Mercury. As you already know from the previous episode, due to health and financial issues, Carl Kiekhafer was forced to sell his company to Brunswick Corporation. Alongside this, he suffered significant financial losses due to the decline in Kiekhafer Mercury stock prices following the sale. Although he retained a leadership position after the sale, he was deeply embittered. Despite this challenging period, Carl's strong character and the engineering team he led continued to bring new products to the market. At the time, Mercury outboard motors were sold in 118 countries through a network of 8,000 dealers. While Keek Hafer struggled with these setbacks, OMC, Outboard Marine Corporation, was entering its golden years, and Chrysler Corporation was making attempts to break into the outboard motor market. Earlier, unsuccessful negotiations between Keek Hafer and Chrysler to sell Mercury did not deter Chrysler from pursuing its ambitions. In 1965, Chrysler acquired West Bend Outboard, which was also marketed under the Elgin and Sears brands. This acquisition secured 29% of the U.S. market. The early 1960s not only reshaped the marine business landscape but also intensified market competition, leading to a partial reduction in prices for end consumers. To be objective and to follow the chronological history of outboard motors, I want to highlight some other manufacturers of that time. During this same period, in Japan in the mid-1950s, a request from a dealer Kihin Motors led to the birth of the Tohatsu outboard motor. With the help of Kihin Motors, the first outboard prototype was developed by combining the Tohatsu T42C 1.2 horsepower engine for sprayers with an American-made lower unit. In 1956, Tohatsu released its first serially produced outboard motor. In 1960, again in Japan, Yamaha debuted its P7 outboard motor and in 1964, Honda introduced the GB30, a four-stroke outboard motor. Not long after, in 1965, Suzuki presented its first outboard motor, the D55. At that time, Japan was far from posing a threat to the American outboards market. However, this did not mean they lacked plans for the future. Within a few years, ambitious Japanese manufacturers would set their sights on Europe and America. For all these brands, I had planned to present separate episodes. Now let's go back to Mercury. Following Carl Kiekhafer's forced resignation from Mercury, he sold his shares in the company, using the proceeds to establish Aeromarine Motors. This company began producing lightweight, air-cooled two-stroke engines for target drones, snowmobiles engines, as well as inboard four-stroke motors for racing boats equipped with stern drives. The quality Aeromarine Motors quickly found a niche in the market, and before long, boats equipped with these motors began winning. This endeavor occupied Carl's time and attention, offering him new horizons for development. Not long after, his son Fred left Aeromarine Motors, for a consulting job signaled the end of an era, leaving Carl disappointed and disinterested in continuing to manage the business and he stepped away. After Kiekhafer's departure, Brooks Abernathy was appointed president of Kiekhafer Mercury. To remain objective and follow historical facts, it's worth noting that in 1967, just three years after Honda released its first outboard motor, it was already making sales in the American market, eventually securing a well-deserved leading global position. In 1971, Mercury opened its first European factory in Belgium. This occurred a decade after OMC had already opened a plant also in Belgium. Later, both companies will open several more factories in different locations around the world. In 1972, Abernathy was promoted to president and COO of Brunswick, and Jack Reichert was appointed president of Mercury. Around this time, Mercury introduced the first-generation, phase-maker, CDI ignition system in some outboard engines. Not long after, the virtually maintenance-free CDI ignition system would replace points ignition across the production line. Meanwhile, sparks of competition between OMC and Yamaha began igniting in the European market, later escalating into a commercial war. OMC's strategy of lowering prices and developing new lines of outboard motors achieved periodic success, 
but ultimately lost market share to Yamaha. The emerging Japanese company used Europe as a springboard, with America as the ultimate target. Mercury Marine, with its forward-thinking leadership, recognized the quality and advantages of Yamaha's outboard motors. Instead of confronting the Japanese, Mercury pursued collaboration, signing a partnership agreement with Yamaha in 1972. Under this agreement, Brunswick and Yamaha jointly owned Sanshin Kojo Corporation, a Yamaha subsidiary producing outboard engines. This collaboration gave rise to the Mariner brand. Initially, Mariner engines were assembled from Yamaha's discontinued models in Yamaha's factories using Japanese parts. In 1974, Mariner engines were first sold in Australia, followed by Europe and America in 1976, indirectly positioning Mercury against OMC. In 1974, Charles Strang left Mercury Marine to become OMC's president and general manager. With deep knowledge of Mercury Marine, he began reorganizing OMC, merging the Johnson and Avinru departments. Simultaneously, OMC faced a prolonged legal battle over environmental pollution, draining significant financial resources. This is the perfect moment to invite those of you who haven't yet watched the fascinating story of OMC and their Johnson and Avinrude motors to check it out. You can find the videos on the Boat Motors YouTube channel or follow the links in the description. Now, let's get back to Mercury. Unburdened by such issues, Mercury Marine underwent a 1975 reorganization into four divisions, Mercury Division, Outboard Motors, Merc Cruiser Division, Inboard Motors, Mariner Division, and Quicksilver Division, Parts and Accessories. In 1976, Mercury introduced the 175 horsepower model 1750V6 Black Max, featuring racing technology. This motor became a legend and was later upgraded to 300 horsepower in 1982, showcasing loop charged engine technology. In May 1992 issue of Boating Magazine, an interesting article explains very well two stroke loop charged engine technology, which I want to quote. The term loop charged refers to the design of a two-stroke engine's transfer ports. The transfer ports carry a fuel-air mixture from the crankcase to the cylinder. The exhaust ports carry waste gases out of the engine. Two decades ago, most outboards had cross-charged cylinders, which had the transfer port or ports directly across from the exhaust port, so there was a flow across the cylinder. A fin-shaped deflector on the piston top prevented the intake charge from exiting out the exhaust port. A loop-charged cylinder may have several transfer ports arrayed around the cylinder that induce a swirl or looping effect as the fuel charge enters the cylinder, which helps the fuel burn more completely. Because a loop-charged cylinder burns fuel more efficiently, it generally offers more performance at high engine speeds and delivers better fuel economy than a cross-charged cylinder. Loop charging requires more complex castings, which add to the cost of an outboard. Cross-charge cylinders also operate more smoothly at low speeds. For that reason, OMC and Mercury Marine still offer cross-charge cylinders on most of their smaller fishing outboards, models that are expected to troll at idle for hours. Almost all Yamaha, Suzuki, Tohatsu, and Nissan models are loop-charged, as are the remainder of the OMC and Mercury lines, so it's really no longer an issue on motors over 40 horsepower. End of quote. In the following year, 1977, Jack Reichert was promoted to President and Chief Operating Officer of Brunswick, while Charles Alexander was appointed President of Mercury Marine. This is the moment to note the fact that, thanks to Jack Reichert, the relationship between Brunswick and Carl Kiekhafer was restored, as he maintained contact with the founder of Mercury until his death. During the same year, 1977, the Suzuki Marine brand was established to exclusively market outboard motors to the U.S. In 1980, Strang became OMC president and CEO, and in 1982 chairman of the board, modernizing and robotizing OMC's production. By 1983, Yamaha officially entered the U.S. market. OMC filed patent infringement lawsuits against Yamaha, resulting in Yamaha losing the legal battle and making design changes to its outboard engines. That same year, the FTC Federal Trade Commission intervened blocking the joint venture between Mercury and Yamaha nine years after Mariner's successful launch. The FTC argued that Mercury Marine was monopolizing the market. As a result, Brunswick had to sell its shares back to Yamaha, opening the market to a strong new competitor. Dealers, already perceiving Yamaha as a prestigious brand, 
saw an increase in Mariner prices as it competed directly with Mercury. In 1981, Tohatsu offered outboard motors to the U.S. market for the first time. Tohatsu was also sold under the Nissan brand, primarily in the U.S. and Canada. On October 5, 1983, Carl Kiekhafer passed away at age 77. The marine industry lost not only a pioneer but also a legend. In the October 5, 1983 issue of the reporter Fon du Lac, Brunswick President Jack Reichert paid tribute to Kiekhafer remarking, Carl Kiekhafer was described many times as an engineering genius. Clearly he was that, but he was a great deal more. He had the imagination and the courage to try new ideas, and he was constantly searching for a better way to do things. Consequently, more than any individual of his generation, he was responsible for building the recreational boating industry into what it is today. He will be missed by his friends at Brunswick and by the entire marine industry. After Carl's death in 1983, his son Fred Kiekhafer secured control of the Aero Marine Motors Company and continued to modernize its production. Not long after, he caught the attention of Mercury Marine, but I'll tell you about that in the next episode. Now, I would like to thank all of you who have already subscribed, as well as those who have just subscribed to the Boat Motors channel. I believe that our team's efforts to create engaging video films will be positively received by you. As you may already know, all new videos are being experimentally published in seven different languages, English, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, German, and Russian. Our goal is to give each of you the opportunity to watch and listen to the videos in your native language, eliminating the need for YouTube's automatic translation and subtitles. This is also a good moment to apologize for any minor inaccuracies in translation and pronunciation of words. As you might expect, creating the video along with its translation, editing, and synchronization takes a lot of time for our team. Therefore, we ask that you leave your comments and feedback on our work, as we hope to eventually move out of the experimental phase and make multilingual versions a standard feature on the Boat Motors channel. Thank you for your support, and we wish you success in all your projects.